Since the earliest moments of recorded history, human beings have always been fascinated by the nighttime sky, the vastness of space, and what wonders lie out there just waiting to be discovered. Though this fetal dream had lived for hundreds of years, it was not until the middle of the 20th century that the goal grew within reach. The weapons of mass destruction used by Nazi Germany in World War II would be reverse engineered and perfected, but instead of delivering a warhead to a ground target, would deliver such incredible thrusts to break the bonds of Earth's gravity and place a man-made object into orbit, and perhaps even further. For the next two decades, the technology of space exploration had increased exponentially. What started as a simple goal of launching the first satellite had blossomed into the unthinkable task of landing a human being on the moon, a quarter million miles from Earth, and bringing him back alive. The sheer fantastic nature of this task, even decades after the fact, had remained so paramount that many people had held onto the belief that the entire venture was an elaborate and expensive hoax. A big contributing factor to this baseless accusation is that the many missions leading to the landing, the advancements achieved, and the many people involved have been all but completely forgotten. Welcome to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space. It is my goal here to provide a complete account of the missions and events that mark the dawn of Earth's manned space program, based on facts, figures, and information all available in public domain. For the next hour, we will present the story of mankind's push into space, exploring the missions in detail. Now, this doesn't mean I'll be boring you with numbers, range rates, and the like, but more the adventure itself, as every mission was, as the title suggests, an odyssey. In the second hour, we will open up to roundtable discussion of today's topic and all things space. Last week, we watched as the space program began. The Soviet Union took an early lead with the first man in space and explored the beginnings of NASA's Mercury program with Alan Shepard aboard spacecraft Freedom 7 and Gus Grissom's dramatic rescue in the sinking of spacecraft Liberty Bell 7. With all the data gathered from this mission lost, NASA was hard-pressed to make yet another suborbital ballistic flight. However, mere weeks before the planned launch, Russian cosmonaut German Titov spends a full day in orbit and returns alive. NASA decides the free world needs a man in orbit or it's all over. Scrubbing the upcoming Mercury Redstone 5 mission and proceeding with a risky orbital mission using the larger Atlas rocket. The Atlas had proved troublesome as many test launches have exploded including the publicly televised Mercury Atlas 1 failure. In the months before Shepard's flight, several more Atlas launches were attempted with varying degrees of success and failure, and NASA was still hesitant to put a man on top. As the original scheduled launch date of Mercury Redstone 5 passed in August, the Atlas was still not ready. Every month that passes adds uneasiness for NASA, as well as astronaut pilot John Glenn scheduled to be the next American to fly. He knows the longer America waits, the more likely the Soviets would leap even further ahead, and NASA would not even know about it until it's figuratively shoved in their faces. On November 29, 1961, four months after Grissom's flight, a Mercury alien finds himself second to a monkey, as a chimpanzee named Enos is strapped into the Mercury capsule for the fifth Atlas test. Once again, concerns from NASA management call for one last test before giving the final go for a manned orbital flight. While the launch proceeded well, the spacecraft itself began to drift from its normal attitude. While the automatic stabilization and control system corrected the deviation, the roll drift would occur again, followed by another correction. This figurative dance of drift and correction would occur nine times before retrofire, after which the spacecraft landed safely in the ocean and Enos was recovered alive. Despite the continued difficulties, NASA finally deemed Mercury Atlas safe for human travel. While NASA works to ready Mercury Atlas 6 for manned flight, an announcement on January 3, 1962 would signal the charter of the Gemini program as an intermediary stage between the Mercury and the lunar missions, named Apollo six months earlier. McDonnell Aircraft, the same contractor that built Mercury, would continue working with NASA on the upcoming Gemini spacecraft. Design and construction would continue on Gemini while the Mercury program rolled on, and there were still five more Mercury astronauts who had yet to fly. America's first orbital flight was scheduled for January 16, 1962, 
and as that day approached, the pesky Atlas rocket would once again give NASA problems. It would take four days to solve the problem with the Atlas's fuel tanks, yet on the second launch day of January 20th, inclement weather forced another delay. On January 27, Glenn would board the spacecraft and prepare for launch, but delays strike once again. At T-29 minutes, the flight director called off the launch because of heavy overcast, which would prevent the necessary photo coverage of the launch. The overcast would finally clear, and the launch was now set for February 1st. Crews began fueling the rocket on January 30, and shortly into the procedure, a fuel leak soaked into the internal insulation of the vehicle and caused another delay for repair, which would last for two weeks. Repairs were finally completed and launch was scheduled for February 14th, but Valentine's Day did not prove too kind for NASA, as once again weather would prevent launch. Finally, on February 18th, the weather would begin to break, and a launch date was given for the sixth time. February 20, 1962. It finally seemed like all systems were go for Mercury Atlas 6. Astronaut John Glenn was strapped into his Mercury spacecraft, which he named Friendship 7, and the final countdown began. In the terminal count of 10 seconds, final words from fellow astronaut Scott Carpenter. Hey, Godspeed, John Glenn. Three, two, one, zero. And the rockets ignited, lifting the spacecraft into the Florida sky. Coming up on two minutes, and fuel is 102, 101, oxygen 78, 102. Hazer building to six. Two minutes into launch, the Atlas separated its first stage booster engines and continued to rise, jettisoning the escape tower ten seconds later, right on schedule. Zico. Lots of great fired, okay. Five minutes from launch, the sustainer engine cut off, and the spacecraft separated itself from the launch vehicle. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, seven, you have a go at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. This is Friendship 7, I can see clear back a big cloud pattern way back across toward the Cape. Beautiful sight. Upon reaching orbit, Glenn reported no disorientation or discomfort pertaining to zero gravity. Running electrical check. All batteries uh, 25 are above, on main, uh, going through orbit checklist. And uh, we're all set. This is very comfortable at zero G. I have... Uh, Nothing but very fine feeling. It just feels uh, very normal and very good. Communication satellites did not exist at this time, therefore requiring a network of ground tracking stations spread in many countries around the globe and on ships stationed in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Despite this thorough preparation, communication was sketchy at best. Hello, Bert. Hello, Bergetta, I receive you loud, clear, how me. Hello, Bermuda, hello, Bermuda, Capcom, Friendship 7, read you loud, clear. Hello, Bermuda, Friend 7, how me. Hello, Bermuda, Capcom, this is Friendship 7, read you loud and clear, how me? Glenn would find himself in periods of silence and static, transmitting in the blind to anyone who could receive. This is Friendship 7, uh, this is Friendship 7, uh, broadcasting in the blind to the Mercury Network. A uh, one, a uh, two, a uh, three, a uh, four, a uh, five. Uh, this is Mercury Friendship 7, uh, out. When communication was established, he would provide constant updates of the capsule's environment and power readings, as well as his own status, which remained quite excellent throughout. Uh, Roger, this is Friendship 7, uh, fuel 9098, uh, uh, oxygen uh, 7, 8, uh, 100, cabin pressure holding 5, 6 at present time. 
Continuing in his first orbit, Glenn would pass into the darkness of night, making contact with Gordo Cooper at the tracking station in Moshe, Australia. Glenn calls down status updates, observations of cloud cover, the assurance of no discomfort or disorientation relating to functioning in a weightless environment, finally including a jovial comment, That was sure a short day. Now uh, that was about the shortest day I've ever run into. Time passes rapidly, huh? Yes, sir. Right. An array of bright lights would come into view from below, during which Cooper informed Glenn that the residents of Perth and Rockingham had turned their lights on for Glenn's flyover. You understand it? Just off to your right there? That's affirmative. Just to my right, I can see a big pattern of lights. The lights show up very well, and I'll thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Very fine. Friendship 7 continued its orbit, approaching daybreak after only 45 minutes of darkness. Just before this, Glenn made an intriguing observation. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I'll try to describe what I'm in here. Uh, I'm in a, a big mass of some very small particles uh, that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little... They're coming by the capsule. Uh, and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. Uh, they swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window, and they're all brilliantly lighted. Uh, they probably average maybe uh, seven or eight feet apart, but I can see them all down below me also. Uh, negative, negative. They're very slow. Uh, they're not going away from me more than maybe uh, uh, three or four miles per hour. They're going at the same speed I am, approximately. They're only very slightly under my speed. Over. Uh, they do. They do have a different motion, though, from me, uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving? Over. Around the time the sun rose, the number of particles would seem to diminish, but a few would seem to follow for the next 10 to 15 minutes. During this point, air-to-ground transmission was still very poor, so ground stations did not seem to fully comprehend just what Glenn was referring to. Or perhaps, ground was preoccupied with something else. As Friendship 7 moved into its second orbit, a strange signal would appear from a sensor, designated Segment 51. This sensor provided data on the landing system, and indicated that the spacecraft's heat shield and landing bag were no longer in the locked position. If this indicator was correct, the heat shield may have come loose, or even worse, may have detached completely. If this were the case, the only things holding the heat shield under the spacecraft were the straps for the retro rocket package, which would be jettisoned immediately after retrofire. And the first indication to Glenn was from the TUYI tracking station, inquiring as to whether or not he felt the particles which surrounded his craft were the actions of his control jets. To Glenn, this surely seemed like a natural inquiry, yet he did not concur, still maintaining that whatever these particles were, they came from outside the spacecraft rather than from the craft itself. As a standard status check continues, a final call advises Glenn to ensure the landing bag deploy switch is in the off position. Glenn did not inquire further, and ground did not inform him of the indicator, instead telling flight controllers to keep an eye on segment 51. Glenn continues on his orbit, making contact with Cooper and Moshe for a second time, at which time repeated the instruction that the landing bag deploy switch should be in the off position followed by inquiries if Glenn had heard any banging or thudding sounds on his craft. By now, Glenn could surely realize something wasn't right, but again did not voice his specific concerns over transmission. It is possible that he was a bit distracted, as Glenn established his contact with Canton, referring to the particles surrounding his craft once again, just before sunrise. Finally, the cryptic message. 
This, of course, raised more questions than it answered. On the third orbit, a decision had to be made. Flight director Chris Kraft, since first receiving the strange signal, had ordered his team to examine possible contingency plans, at the same time examining the possibility that it was an instrumentation problem. Either way, the longer Glenn stays in orbit, the more complicated the situation would become. Before passing into darkness, Friendship 7 was ordered to begin retrofire procedures, despite not completing the planned seven orbits. Ground Station Hawaii informed Glenn that they had been receiving the landing bag deploy signal, but suspect it may be false. To troubleshoot this, they directed Glenn to toggle the landing bag deploy switch into the automatic position. Uh, uh, we have been reading an indication on the ground on segment 51, which is landing bag deploy. Uh, we suspect this is a running signal. However, Kate would like you to check this by putting the landing bag switch in auto position and seeing if you get a light. Do you concur with this, over? Okay, if that's what they recommend, we'll go ahead and try it. Are you ready for it now? Yes, when you're ready. Roger. Not negative. In automatic position, I did not get a light, and I'm back in the off position now. Over. Uh, Roger, that's fine. In this case, we'll go ahead and the uh, reentry sequence will be normal. Roger, reentry sequence will be normal. If this light appeared, it would be clear indication that the heat shield was indeed loose. This would cause Glenn to incinerate on reentry, should the heat shield detach even slightly. However, the light did not appear, and even though the flight control team was split, Kraft had agreed with the determination that the segment 51 was giving a false indicator and chose to ignore it. Despite this conclusion, NASA management gets involved, overriding Kraft's decision, instead ordering the flight control team to proceed with a makeshift solution to hold the potentially loose heat shield in place. As Glenn passes over California, he is given the final go for retro sequence start, followed by a directive to delay retro jettison until over Texas. Sudden G-forces pound on Glenn as the retro rockets fire. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Roger, retros are firing. Yeah, they do. Are they ever? It feels like I'm going back toward Hawaii as a craft begins to slow and descend. As Friendship 7 passes over the coast, Glenn receives a message from the Texas tracking station. This is Texas Capcom Friendship 7. We are recommending that you leave the retro package on to the entire re-entry. This means that you will have to override the 05G switch, which is expected to occur at 0443. This also means that you will have to manually retract the scope. Do you read? Uh, this is Friendship 7. Now, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. Not at this time. This is the judgment of Cape Flight. Less than a minute later, as Friendship 7 came within range of Florida, Cape would repeat the recommendation. I like to bring that to you. I'm not sure I'm going to have to run in by those who said. Flight Director Kraft did know there were tremendous difficulties and risks with this optimal procedure. While the theory was sound, the retro package burning up on re-entry could potentially damage a perfectly good heat shield, putting Glenn at even further risk. Kraft makes one final plea to NASA management, but is once again overridden. Finally, Glenn begins to breach into the atmosphere, overriding the O5G switch as instructed, as friction of re-entry begins to heat up the spacecraft. 
Glenn begins to hear what he describes as small things brushing against the capsule, before finally a heavy thud. Uh, this is Friendship 7, I think the uh, pack just let go. Shortly followed by... This is Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. And then radio blackout. This blackout was met calmly, as this period had already been predicted when the buildup of ionized plasma around the spacecraft prevents radio communication. Yet during this period of approximately three minutes, Mercury Control would not know if Glenn had survived. When we return, the outcome of Friendship 7 changes NASA forever. You have been listening to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space on Cymax Radio, the sci-fi voice of the universe. You're listening to Radio Odyssey, 50 Years of Space. When we left off, John Glenn aboard spacecraft Friendship 7 was directed to re-enter early, as his spacecraft was signaling that the heat shield may be loose, though the flight director feels the signal may be false. As Glenn streaks through the steadily thickening atmosphere, and the retro rocket package which he had been instructed to keep attached had finally been stripped away, the radio transmission becomes shrouded and static because of ionization blackout. For three minutes, no one would know if Glenn had survived. Tracking continued to follow the spacecraft as it began to oscillate back and forth by about 10 degrees in both directions. Though the craft would periodically stabilize, the oscillation would continue as flight controllers anxiously watched the altitude drop. As tracking displayed the spacecraft's position at 28,000 feet, the drogue parachute deploys, followed by voice contact with Glenn. The green suit is on green, shoot it out in reef condition at 10,800 feet in. Beautiful shoot. Shoot looks good. As the craft continued to descend, a normal landing would ensue, antenna section jettisoning on time, followed by deployment of the main parachute. Glenn was reminded to manually deploy the landing bag, and after toggling the switch, a green light came on, a clunk could be heard, the heat shield dropped from below the spacecraft, and the landing bag deployed properly, as if nothing had ever been wrong with it. With successful recovery of Friendship 7, NASA could begin an in-depth analysis of the spacecraft and determine exactly what happened. As craft suspected, the heat shield was never loose. The false indicator given by the Segment 51 sensor was a faulty sensor switch. This signaled a turning point for NASA beyond the completion of their first orbital mission. Chris Kraft would emphasize that overriding his decision could have cost Glenn his life when he was never in any danger beyond the normal challenges of the flight. With the spacecraft moving 7 miles per second, 100 miles above the surface of the Earth, there's no time for committee and in-depth discussion regarding important decisions. Kraft would therefore make a change in NASA policy which would continue for the entirety of the organization. From now on, one man would have the final say in all decisions during spaceflight, the flight director. It becomes the job description of the flight director to assume total responsibility for the lives of the crew and success of the mission. While a mission is in flight, the authority of the flight director becomes absolute, and even the President of the United States cannot reverse a decision made in real time. As for the strange particles Glenn encountered in his orbit, that remained a mystery that would not be solved until the next mission. With the overall success of America's first orbital flight, NASA prepares to continue with its aggressive mission schedule. Reaching the middle of the Mercury lineup, the fourth American to fly in space will be Donald K. Slayton, known to the public as Deke. With Mercury's ability to fly orbital mission proven, it is now up to Deke to further study the effects of orbital flight on the human body, as well as the first study of liquids in weightlessness. Following the establishment of Mercury craft names, Deke calls his Mercury Atlas spacecraft Delta-7. Once again, 7 refers to the seven Mercury astronauts, and Delta being the fourth letter in the Greek alphabet, signifying the fourth flight of the program. Riding high after Glenn's safe return, Deke spends the weeks before launch in the simulator, 
along with Scott Carpenter as his backup. On March 15, while training in the G-loading centrifuge, the flight surgeons express caution as Deke begins to show an erratic heart rate. After more detailed medical examinations, Deke Slayton is diagnosed with a condition called idiopathic atrial fibrillation. Though he claims to feel up to the task of spaceflight, NASA administration feels the risk is too great to allow Deke to fly into orbit. Finally, on September of 1962, one of America's seven greatest pilots is grounded from all NASA space flights indefinitely. Shortly after this decision, the Air Force followed suit, and Slayton found his flight career effectively over, resigning his commission the following year. Though Slayton could no longer fly, he remained with the NASA program in an administrative capacity as a civilian. A new position within NASA was created specifically for him, referred to as Director of Flight Crew Operations, unofficially called Chief Astronaut. Deke oversees all aspects of the program that pertain to the individual flight crew members, and is integral in selecting crews for the upcoming Gemini and Apollo missions. But with Slayton grounded, NASA would utilize a backup for the first time, as Malcolm Scott Carpenter is advanced to the prime crew of Mercury Atlas 7, which he renamed Aurora 7 to illustrate high-altitude scientific study. Carpenter was well suited for this mission, being a trained scientist in his own right beyond his test pilot experience. On May 24, 1962, Aurora 7 launches on NASA's second orbital mission, scheduled for three orbits. For the first time, liquids could be examined in the weightlessness of space, and Carpenter thoroughly enjoyed this experience. He also greatly enjoyed observing the Earth from high altitude through his tiny window and periscope as he proceeded with many various photographic experiments. As the mission proceeded, the fuel indicator began to read far lower than anticipated. It was believed that Carpenter had been so fascinated by observing the Earth that he wasted fuel unnecessarily in order to get the views he wanted. It didn't help matters when the fireflies returned, the same luminescent particles that Glenn had observed in the previous flight. NASA was still unable to adequately explain these particles until Carpenter inadvertently bumped the hull of his craft, creating a larger shower of particles, which he referred to as snowflakes. This was all the evidence needed, as the particles surely were frozen condensation that would accumulate in the darkness of night and break free as the heat grew from sunrise, melting away minutes thereafter. Corroborated by Glenn's earlier observations, a simple circumstantial curiosity that put on a brilliant visual display. The fuel was another more serious matter as the RCS thrusters began to run dry. What ground did not know was a malfunction in the pitch horizon sensor, a component of the spacecraft's automatic control system, caused the craft to expend extra fuel when Carpenter attempted to compensate for the directional bias. During this, Carpenter would periodically and inadvertently used the re-entry control thrusters, for which there was no backup. By the time re-entry approached, there were doubts in NASA whether or not Aurora 7 had sufficient fuel. Furthermore, the malfunctioning control system was throwing off trajectory by as much as 40 degrees, and only Carpenter knew it. Neglecting to inform NASA of the malfunction, Carpenter takes Aurora 7 into the atmosphere, and the spacecraft is once again shrouded by radio blackout. The calculated time of reacquisition is three minutes, but as that time passes, all that is heard is static. Several more minutes pass by, still no word from Carpenter. As the clock continues to tick by in silence, NASA begins to fear that they may have lost their first astronaut in space. After an hour of silence, recovery forces finally spot the spacecraft 402 kilometers off target Carpenter floating in a life raft nearby. America breathes a heavy sigh of relief as Carpenter and Aurora 7 are recovered safely. Away from the eyes of the public, NASA management expresses concerns about the flight. Some in NASA even blame Carpenter for the problems that occurred, not only the fuel shortage, but the guidance malfunction that he neglected to mention. NASA finally decides to remove Carpenter from the active flight roster 
temporarily reassigning him to the Navy's Sea Lab project. It was later determined that the fuel shortage was entirely the fault of the guidance malfunction, but NASA had little means of determining this at the time. With the departure of Carpenter and Slayton from active flight, and Glenn announcing his retirement from NASA a year afterward, the Mercury 7 soon find themselves reduced to four. The word on the Soviet space program had been silent for 16 months. A big bombshell would reach the ears of the American press. The Soviet Union launches two spacecraft back to back, setting not only brand new endurance records, but the first ever dual mission in space. First to launch was cosmonaut Andrian Nikolaev aboard Vostok 3 on August 11, 1962. After spending a full day in orbit, he was joined by Vostok 4, flown by Pavel Popovich. These craft would not rendezvous, however. The technology did not yet exist for spacecraft to perform a precise approach, and the Vostok did not have thrusters that would steer the craft beyond simple attitude control. Their paths were as such that Nikolaev and Popovich would fly as close as 5 kilometers. However, in actuality, the two craft would only reach 6.5 kilometers at the closest point. Still, the two cosmonauts would communicate with each other in orbit, another first in space. In alternating periods of an hour each, the two cosmonauts would leave the seats of their respective craft and float free in their cabin, testing the ability to maneuver and work in weightless conditions. The results of these tests were deemed positive, showing clear evidence of a human's ability to function in prolonged periods of microgravity. The flight of Vostok 4 was planned to take as long as Vostok 3, if not longer. However, difficulties began to arise with the spacecraft. A malfunction in Vostok 4's life support system caused the temperature inside the cabin to drop to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Ground control was informed of this, and the flight was terminated early due to a misunderstanding as flight controllers thought that Popovich had given the early recall code word, which he did not. Still, nearly unbeatable records were set. Andrian Nikolaev in Vostok 3 would spend nearly four full days in space, orbiting the Earth 64 times, and landing safely in the Soviet Union. Pavel Popovich in Vostok 4 would also return safely, landing just seven minutes after his counterpart. When we return, Mercury rolls on with two astronauts left to fly and more questions left to answer. You've been listening to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space on Cymax Radio, the sci-fi voice of the universe. You're listening to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space. After two successful orbital flights and the surprising Soviet dual mission, the American Mercury program continues. Overall, Aurora 7 had completed its scientific goals. Now NASA focuses on the more engineering-focused questions regarding the capability of their spacecraft. On October 3, 1962, Mercury Atlas 8 would take astronaut Wally Schirra on a planned six-orbit mission aboard spacecraft Sigma-7. Launch was tricky from the get-go, as ten seconds into the flight, the Atlas booster began a sudden unplanned roll. This had threatened the possibility of a launch abort, but the booster's maneuvering thrusters managed to correct this deviation. Minutes later, when the rocket staged, the booster section cut off two seconds early. Though this was not life-threatening, if the sustainer engine cut off in a similar fashion, the craft would not be able to maintain orbit for the duration of the mission. Though this did not happen, the sustainer engine burned for 10 seconds longer than expected, instead sending Shira to an even higher orbit than planned. Examination determined that the orbit was stable for more than seven orbits, so there was no need for an early abort, and the mission was allowed to continue. Most of the experiments in this flight were passive, specifically an array of eight different ablative materials attached to the outside of the craft to test their performance during the heat of re-entry. For the first half of the flight, Shira focused primarily on maneuvers and testing the ability to hold attitude using the Earth, Moon, and Star constellations as reference points. 
Entering the third orbit, tests required the spacecraft's gyroscopes to be disconnected and much of the electrical systems shut down, allowing the spacecraft to drift freely with no active control. This would continue into the fourth orbit, as Shira completed simple observational and photographic experiments. Shira regained control of his spacecraft on the fifth orbit, testing maneuvering capability after a long period of powerless drift. The thrusters would fire, but stronger than before, and using more fuel than intended. Despite this, fuel expenditure was actually far less than originally planned, as Shira would take great care with maneuvers, conserving fuel whenever possible. The sixth and final orbit was dominated by preparation for re-entry, with an engineering request requiring the capsule to remain on automatic control for the entire maneuver. Shira reported the automatic system held the capsule steady as a rock for the deorbit burn. However, he was dismayed at how quickly it burned the, all the fuel he had saved during the flight. After a smooth splashdown in recovery, Shira had one final engineering request of a more personal nature, as he would manually blow the spacecraft's hatch once safely on the carrier. In triggering the explosive hatch, a definitive bruising was shown on his hand from operating the ejector switch. A year earlier, when Gus Grissom was accused of prematurely triggering the hatch, leading to the sinking of his Liberty Bell 7's capsule, no such bruising was shown on his hand or anywhere on his body. This had given further evidence in Grissom's favor, exonerating him of any blame for the loss of his spacecraft. Though limited experiments were moderately unsuccessful, all the mission objectives were completed, and the flight itself was considered a textbook flight with no major malfunctions beyond minor annoyances. The fuel usage was also considerably less than anticipated, and credit for this was given entirely to Shira. Because of such a near flawless flight, observers suggested that the program should end on a high note, rather than risk the potentially catastrophic flight. NASA, however, did not agree with this consideration, as the flight had proven the planned day-long mission was technically feasible, and also felt it was necessary to bring the Mercury program up to the level the Soviet Vostok had established. During this time, McDonnell Aircraft worked closely with the astronauts for both the Mercury and upcoming Gemini programs. As only one of the original Mercury 7 remained to fly, it was clear with Gemini and eventual lunar flights, NASA would be required to increase its astronaut roster substantially. With the new challenges of upcoming projects, Candidates would be required to have not only test pilot experience, but advanced engineering degrees as well. NASA's answer came in September 17, 1962, with the second group of astronauts, calling themselves the New Nine. Of these nine pilots, two had been among the candidates of the original seven, two would not be on active duty in the United States military, and many would become some of the most famous of the astronaut corps. These new astronauts would be ex-Navy pilot Neil Armstrong, Air Force pilot Frank Borman, Charles Pete Conrad Jr. from the Navy, James Lovell, also from the Navy, from the Air Force, James McDivitt, another Navy retiree, Elliot C., from the Air Force, Thomas P. Stafford, also from the Air Force, Edward White, and finally from the Navy, John Young. The new nine worked very closely with the Gemini program, alongside Gus Grissom, assisting in the design of the Gemini spacecraft, all eagerly awaiting the final results of Project Mercury's conclusion. This conclusion would come on May 15, 1963, with the mission Mercury Atlas 9 and astronaut Gordo Cooper aboard spacecraft Faith 7. Appropriate name in many ways, as this mission would test NASA's faith in their hardware and man's ability to survive the hostile environment of space, scheduling a full day-long mission spanning 22 orbits. A perfect launch of the spacecraft, and Cooper was given the initial go for seven orbits, from Gus Grissom sitting at Capcom, or Capsule Communicator. Working on his list of 11 experiments, it would not be until the seventh revolution that Cooper would be given a go for 17 orbits, at which time he surpassed Shiraz's record set seven months earlier. Among the many firsts for U.S. in this flight 
Gordo would become the first American to sleep in space, though he would often wake up and sneak a couple extra pictures of the Earth. The spacecraft would not begin to experience technical problems until its 19th orbit, though it was a simple matter of a faulty indicator light. However, on the 21st orbit, a short circuit left the automatic stabilization and control system without electrical power. This meant that all attitude control maneuvers and corrections would have to, have to be made manually. While NASA scrambled to find a solution, it would be John Glenn who would help create the revised checklist, reporting up to his colleague. Taking manual control of his spacecraft, Cooper would begin re-entry following a manually assisted countdown by Glenn, disappearing into radio blackout and reappearing three minutes later only four miles away from the main recovery ship. This sets the record as the most accurate landing to date, all without the assistance of automatic controls. Faith 7 returned safely after a flight of 34 hours and 19 minutes, ending the Mercury program in complete triumph. Months earlier, NASA had laid plans for continued Mercury flights, namely Mercury Atlas 10, returning Alan Shepard into space for a three-day orbital mission. In later planning stages, the possibility arose that MA-10 would be flown as a dual mission with Mercury Atlas 11, in similar fashion to Russia's Vostok 3 and 4 flights. This idea was abandoned, and NASA felt no need for a simple orbital flyby, when rendezvous was one of the mission objectives for the upcoming Gemini flights. MA-10 was also in question when NASA referred to MA-9 as the culmination of the Mercury program. Though the debate continued, as there was still Mercury hardware available, thus conceivably saving on cost of new Gemini hardware. Despite this fact, on May 11th, NASA declared publicly that if MA-9 was successful, there would be no MA-10. A further announcement would make it official on June 12th, when NASA Administrator James Webb publicly stated there that there would be no further Mercury flights. Shepard would not get his seat on Freedom 7-2, but was at the top of the list for Gemini's first flight, slated for early 1965. The United States was on track to proceed with a more ambitious space program, while at the same time the Soviet Union was poised to make another first in manned space flight, this time with a woman. On June 14, 1963, Valery Bayovsky launched into orbit on Vostok 5, followed two days later by Vostok 6 with the first female in space in the person of Valentina Tereshkova. Much like the dual mission of Vostok 3 and 4, the two capsules were on converging orbits but would still not perform a rendezvous with the limited attitude control system of the spacecraft. Little else is known of this mission beyond the historical importance and the length of each flight. Vostok 6 lasting just over two days, while Vostok 5 lasted five days, becoming a record of solo spaceflight that still holds to this day. This record was intended to be set even higher, as the original plan for Vostok 5 was eight days, but high solar flare activity caused this plan to be pushed back to five. This achievement did little to slow NASA, as such records would soon be broken with the new two-man Gemini spacecraft. Designed as an intermediary step between Mercury and the upcoming lunar flights of Apollo, Gemini would test and prove many of the techniques required for lunar flight. The objectives of this program include demonstrating endurance of both astronauts and equipment in long-duration space flights of up to two weeks accomplishing rendezvous and docking with another spacecraft in Earth orbit, demonstrating extravehicular activity, or EVA, evaluating the astronaut's ability to perform tasks outside the spacecraft, perfecting atmospheric re-entry and landing at pre-selected locations, and to provide astronauts with hands-on experience with these techniques for upcoming Apollo flights. Though similar in basic design as Mercury, the Gemini spacecraft will have several notable improvements. The most important is the Orbital Attitude and Maneuvering System, or OMS, providing not only attitude control, but will actually move the spacecraft in all three axes. A detachable equipment module 
basically looking like a white cone section in the back of the black bell-shaped craft, providing additional power, propulsion, and life support systems, discarded before re-entry. An Agena target vehicle, developed alongside Gemini, to be used for rendezvous, docking, and orbital maneuvers with its own rocket engine, allowing the spacecraft combination to boost into larger orbit altitudes. Gemini also included an onboard guidance computer, in-flight radar, and an artificial horizon similar to aircraft instrumentation. Many of these aircraft-inspired functions were influenced by Gus Grissom, who worked closely with McDonnell Aircraft in development and design. With Deke Slayton now serving as Director of Flight Crew Operations, he plans a deliberate flight rotation so that astronauts of each Gemini flight will be in prime position for the upcoming lunar landing missions, making sure that the first commands will be given to the four remaining Mercury astronauts, Shepard, Grissom, Shira, and Cooper. Along with the astronauts of the new nine, a third class of astronauts will be added on October of 1963 to round out the Gemini schedule and lead into Apollo. This group was composed of 14 men. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, William Anders, Charles Bassett, Alan Bean, Eugene Cernan, Roger Chaffee, Michael Collins, Walter Cunningham, Don Isley, Theodore Freeman, Richard Gordon, Russell Schweikert, David Scott, and Clifton Curtis C.C. Williams. Not only were NASA's numbers rising fast, but so were their spirits as the space program continued onward. But soon, a devastating event would shatter morale and change NASA forever. On November 25th, 1963, on the back of a convertible in Dallas, Texas, the man who gave NASA their ultimate challenge, United States President John F. Kennedy, was killed by an assassin's bullet, driving deep into the hearts of the entire nation. Shortly thereafter, Vice President Lyndon Johnson would address the American people. A great leader is dead. A great nation must move on. And as we bow our heads in submission to divine providence, let us also thank God for the years he gave us inspiration through his servant, John F. Kennedy and to honor his memory and the future of the works he started. I have determined today that station number one of the Atlantic Missile Range and the NASA Launch Operations Center in Florida shall hereafter be known as the John F. Kennedy Space Center. What began as sadness and rage quickly blossomed into purpose, as the goal of putting a man on the moon within the decade was no longer a challenge to NASA but was now a crusade. This was their mission, a mission that would be accomplished in the time frame Kennedy specified, and there was no one who could tell NASA otherwise. When we return, we will open up to roundtable discussion on today's topic and all things space. You're listening to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space on CIMAX Radio, the sci-fi voice of the universe.